Hey, welcome everybody to Monday Live. Listen, we have a very, very, very good program today. You're going to be super blessed. But first of all, I want to say I'm looking at this. This is really cool. Uh, uh, from Missouri, people are watching. Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, New Zealand. Uh, that, that's, this is awesome. I, I love doing this program. I love doing everything I do, actually. And this is great, just watching all the people on here already. And I have a very special guest with me today that's not from Texas, because it seems like almost all of my guests are from Texas. Uh, please welcome Mark Henry from Minnesota. Mark, this is great having you here. Hey, Tom, it's great to be with you again. So th this is going to be fantastic. So, uh, by the way, we have radio coming up with Jam Markell. And uh, most people don't know your connection with Jam Markell's ministry. And uh, so you're, 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 this is great. I, I'm excited about it. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to be recording together and uh, having a great time with Jan. And actually, you're the one that introduced me to Jan. So uh, you're, you're the one that initiated all that. Well, this is what you said. You said, I'm moving to Minnesota. I said, you know what? Let me connect you with Jan Markell. And now you're on Jan's board and you have been for a while. And it's just uh, fantastic. She's super blessed by you. I'm blessed by you. You inspire me. By the way, you have MarkHenryMinistries.com. Not to be confused with Mark Henry, the wrestler. Is that correct? No, that's that's my little brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty funny. We're going to have a really good program. And uh, listen, you all are going to be super blessed. By the way, I want to make sure I say this before we continue. On February 10th, that's two weeks from this Thursday in Minnesota, Mark at your church, Brooklyn Park. It's going to be you and Jam Markell and myself that Thursday evening. And I am pretty excited. I'm not excited about going to the cold, but no, it is going to be cold, Tom. It's going to be cold, but you're going to have a great time. We're going to warm you up. We're going to have the heaters going for you. Hot coffee, a hot chocolate. You'll be all set. But people can join us uh, and watch live uh, at MarkHenryMinistries.com. And we would just invite, of course, the whole audience to join us. That's going to be great. So anybody not in Minnesota can join. I'm looking at the airplane thinking it's going to be landing somewhere in Minneapolis, probably on a runway that's full of ice. And I'm concerned about the airplane kind of going like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is the pilots here got that figured out. We don't lose many airplanes. Not many. <laughs> Not many. All right. We have a whole lot to talk about. And uh, so I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, we're going to get in. I, I tell you, what, let's start here. I was going to start with Ukraine and Russia and uh, talk to you a little bit about that. But I want to go here, first of all, because we're going to get into the Ukraine-Russia issue, amongst some other things. Um, and then we're going to take live questions as, as people watching this know right now. But uh, Mark, critical race theory is dividing America. And uh, you've spoken on this. You've written about it. Um, it's dividing even the Democrat Party. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you because, we, you know, we see so much that's happening out there right now. So much chaos and confusion. It's coming from every single direction that there is. Uh, take it away. Yeah, and we got to think about critical theory, not just okay. critical race theory, but critical theory is a Marxist ideology that says that there's always an oppressor and an oppressee. And so in Marxism, it's always to divide, divide and conquer. It's very demonic. And uh, it's been applied in the United States, um, uh, critical theory, men versus women. Why do we have this tension between men and women in the United States? It has to do with critical theory. Men are oppressing women, therefore men are evil. Um, it's been applied uh, in, the, in the household, in families. Uh, parents are oppressing children, therefore the state needs to step in and rescue children from the oppressive parents. That's the reason they don't want to hear from us. And we've just a couple of days ago uh, heard from the, the uh, Secretary of Education that you know parents coming in and talking to school board meetings are homegrown terrorists. So um, that's part of that critical theory uh, dividing again, America and even our own homes. Uh, we see it in the, in the element of race um, uh, and the racial tensions that we've seen over the last two years. But we're also seeing its effect in even the Democratic Party who's, who's driving a lot of this. There was a, uh, a poll this last week, and again, <laughs> this is an actual poll. I, I, I read it, I was shocked, and it's just talking about views about vaccines. And it said 55 
percent of Democrats want to fine you if you're not vaccinated. So that means think about the Democratic Party. It's split over this very issue. And then you go down through and talks about 59 percent want to confine the unvaccinated to their home. So 60 percent, 60, 40 split, 48 um, percent uh, want to fine or imprison those who question uh, you know, how effective this whole this whole situation has been. Forty five percent um, want people to be uh, forcibly uh, tracked. Um, but get this one. Twenty nine percent said that children should be taken away from their parents. So if you just think about that from a country standpoint, if you have Republicans representing 50 percent, now, this isn't exactly accurate, but it, it works for our conversation. 50% Republican, 50% Democrat. And, and then you look at a segment, that segment of the Democrats, a third of them believe that the children should be taken away from parents over this very subject that we're all watching over the last two and a half years. And that's that's pretty telling. Yeah. Oh, that's ex extremely telling. So when you look at it, what's really happened is this division that's been brought so, and, and also critical race theory is just one part of critical theory. So this isn't to be confused with critical thinking, which is in, which is entirely <laughs> different. But that's how that's how it's spun is let's be a critical thinker. So people buy into it. Well, I'm thinking critically. No, you're not. Uh, you, you've got uh, you're going one particular direction. But, you know, you look at the division that has come. So now we have good citizen versus bad citizen. These people are bad. These are bad citizens. I'm sure you saw, saw, uh, saw uh, Emmanuel Macron, who said uh, just a week or two ago, something about a particular group of people who I can't mention here will be, um, uh, they're not even, they shouldn't even be considered citizens. You know, if you're Absolutely. not going along with their, their um, plan. You know, so this is what right. we're looking at. And this is what you're speaking of. These are facts. These are the actual numbers that you just quoted. Yeah, this this was a study, Rasmussen study, uh, this last week, poll this last week. Okay. Where do you think this and is so, going? Uh, this is this is pushing America to tribalism. Uh, a lot of times we talk about identity politics, but it, in a bigger, bigger scope, it's really tribalism where you have division, strife. And I would suggest to you, if this trend continues, and we may talk about it today if, if you so choose, the subject of economics, uh, we are moving rapidly towards the conditions which are typical when countries go through civil wars. And I've been in countries that have gone through civil wars, uh, seen the aftermath. God forbid that America should experience that. But if you look through history, um, there are a number of factors that always come into place when civil wars take place. And uh, the division that we're seeing in the country is one of those key elements. Oh, oh, totally. Rather than rather than seeing ourselves as Americans, uh, you know, and, and, and I protect you, you protect me, we protect our children. Uh, once once we get divided, then it's every person for himself or every group for themselves. And it's Katie bar the door. Yeah. And, you know, and this is really a global phenomena, isn't it? That's taking place. It's not just America. Well, it's Marxism marketed around the world. So it's not just happening yeah. here in the United States. It's global in nature. Yeah. So there's this Davos uh, this last week. Pardon me. Davos this last Davos oh. this last week. Yeah. In in their in their video series, of course, they held off because of the pandemic. So they're going to be meeting in in May now, May twenty second. But uh, just watching through, you know, their video series from last week. I mean, this is global. It's it, all the talking points are the same. It's about globalism and a universal government and. You know, yeah, it, it amazes me when you look at it, when you have one voice, they've got one voice, they have one mind. It's all it's all the same. But yet this is what the book of Revelation says. Revelation 17 with the 10 kings, they all ha are of one mind and they give their power and authority to the beast. And also a few verses later in Revelation chapter 17, the Bible says God put it into their hearts to be of one mind so that he could fulfill his prophecy. So as I look at this, everything is going that direction. Prophecy will be fulfilled. Daniel wrote that in Daniel chapter 9. The Bible says it's going to be fulfilled. Jesus is coming back. So when, when I look at these things, I project things are going to get much worse but if you know Christ, 
you know, you got hope. You got hope, but here's something else. We as Christians have to emotionally go through this transition. I mean, it's one thing for us to read it in the Bible and say, hey, these things are coming, but it's another thing to live through it. And I think that's kind of where, as I'm watching my family, friends, neighbors, our church, extended family, friends, everyone's kind of like, okay, we know that God has to judge sin. I mean, you and I have been preaching for 30 years, myself, 33 years. America cannot be killing children like we are and expect God's blessing. We say, God bless America, but you can't be killing 63 million children and expect God's blessing. And so eventually the consequences to our sins catch up. Remember that great verse in Galatians where it says, um, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatever a person sows they reap. You sow to the flesh, death and decay, sow to the spirit, it's life. And so there's consequences. And we've often talked about the Romans chapter one and the stages there. If we're in that third stage, mm -hmm. like, I think you believe that we are, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be surprised at the things that are going on. So how do we grow in our faith? How do we walk with God through these days? That's really the key. Yeah, I do believe we're in that third stage of being given over. As God says in three times in Romans chapter one, I will give them over, I'll give them over, I'll give them over, I'll give them over to their lusts. Uh, this is what you wanna do, I'll give you over, I will give you over to the third time he says to a reprobate mind where uh, a mind so perverted it can't even think in its own best interest. I mean, you look at what New York City mayor's doing, San Francisco mayor, Los Angeles mm -hmm. mayor, Chicago mayor, and now, so this just broke over the weekend. So the New York City mayor says, hey, um, we're not, listen, you commit a crime with a gun, it's gonna be okay. Yet a nine-year-old girl was arrested for not having her particular uh, passport in a restaurant, right? So you have that. But now the mayor says over the weekend, this breaks, uh, we have a crime problem. We really need help. Well, duh. I mean, d but at the same time, it seems intentionally that they're doing this to create what you're talking about, this Marxist society. Absolutely. And, and it's only going to increase why? Professing to be wise, we act like fools. Act like fools. Okay, I'm gonna ask you about this, the economy. So, I mean, you know, you've written several things about it, but I'm, I, I'm looking at the economy. I want your, your, your thoughts on it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw out what I think. I, I mean, I don't paint a very good picture, a p very pleasant picture. I think it's going to get worse. I don't think you can print up trillions of dollars and think things are gonna go good. I think that's intentional, by the way, to co crash the economy. I look at the supply chains, everything I see, it's gonna get worse. I hear reports, in fact, I'm gonna do an update on Thursday this week. I have one Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week. And um, the one on Thursday, I'm gonna be talking about the food problem that we have, the food shortage that it looks like is coming. Uh, you used to live here in California. You got out of California, uh, but it, but California has been the major producer of much of the the uh, fruits and nuts and other things, vegetables uh, for the entire country. Things have changed. Decisions have been made, but the economy itself is just it's just looking. It is not looking good from my perspective. What's your thoughts? Wow. Okay. So this is one of the things that uh, I've focused a lot of uh, the last three months thinking about and, and studying and reflecting on. And so you've got this, this movement of currency, uh, America starts and we have a, a hard monetary system, gold and silver. So you can you remember the old gold coins, $20 gold pieces, for example, or $10 gold pieces. So that's called hard money. And then we have uh, bank notes. And so we have the gold all put in one place and then we, we, we issue dollars, but they're notes backed by gold and silver silver certificates, for example, uh, they, they were out before you were, before you were born. I, I, I had one, I, I had one, and I'm older than you, just so, just so everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. So, in fact, so Mark's way younger than me, but he's so smart. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so then in the seventies, Nixon takes us off the gold standard. So now we're going to print money and it's not backed by gold. So that's called fiat money. So you got these, these, these three elements of money and it, it's this revolving circle. And so as, as a nation collapses, as an empire collapses, um, they move through those three cycles and then that, that currency is devalued and destroyed and another currency comes. So over the last uh, 300 years, there's been about 750 different currencies around the world. 
Uh, the three that have survived over the last, um, well, since 1850 would be the US dollar, the pound and the Swiss franc. And so those are the only three that have survived since 1850. So this, this cycle mm. now is, is taking place. And when I trusted Christ uh, there in your valley years ago, I remember reading through the Bible and was like, how in the world could we ever have this global economy and so forth if, uh, uh, if the U.S. dollar is so strong? I couldn't figure out how that, would, how that would happen because my whole life, the U.S. dollar has been the reserve currency of the world. In other words, if you lived in another part of the world, your value of your your monetary system may be devalued, but you you knew if you had greenbacks, if you had the U.S. dollar, you were safe. And so our missionaries, literally around the world, we send them you know a thousand dollars for their support. They would keep it in U.S. dollars until they needed it because, let's say, they're in Southeast Asia, that their currency would be up and down, usually down, 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 down. So, um, as we devalue the dollar, consequences are coming. The question is what do we do and how do we apply verses mm -hmm. to that? Because that this is going to affect us in big ways. We as Americans are clueless as to what's coming yeah. as we lose reserve status. And okay. so I, let me throw this out there. I, I, I believe we are being moved to a digital currency and I personally believe, and I don't think, you know, a lot of people don't believe us. A lot of uh, prophecy teachers don't believe this. I believe it. Um, and I believe that what is happening to the economy globally is intentional. There's an intentional collapse that's coming. It's necessary to move us to a digital currency. It's necessary to get us onto the next thing. It's also necessary for prophecy to be fulfilled regarding the mark of the beast. So it is coming. People don't want to hear it's coming. These globalists are not going to stop the progress. I think there's a narrative that's changing regarding some things like um, some of the medical things that are happening, but they're not going to stop the move march towards globalism and the economy uh, is is going to tank and we don't know when it, it's going to completely collapse. We don't know the timing of the rapture. It could very well be the time of the black horse, which is after the rapture, but we don't know when that's going to be. So give our viewers what your take what, is there hope or what should we do what, what should people do i think they want to know that okay i think there's a couple things number one is i think there's verses that you and i have to remember as followers of the living god since we don't know when the rapture is you and i need to make the best and godliest decisions given the situations and the opportunities we have currently so proverbs 13 18 for example poverty and shame will come to him who neglects discipline Right now, you and I need to be disciplined with our dollars, how we handle finances, how we handle debt, how we handle the, the assets that we have. And it doesn't matter what country you're from. If, if you're in Australia or uh, West Africa, for example, it might be a little bit different, but your opportunities are now to prepare. Um, and remember this, Proverbs 14, 23 says this, in all labor, there is profit but mere talk leads only to poverty. See, there's a lot of people talking, well, we should do something. And yeah, the economy is going to get bad. The question is stop talking and do something. So let me give your listeners just a couple of quick things that they need to be doing. Number one is if you haven't made a, uh, a net worth statement, you need to do that. And basically a net worth statement is just a simple diagram that shows the assets that you have, the liabilities that you have. And the question is, how do you limit your liabilities, increase your assets? Because that's what you're going to need in a collapsing society. I've traveled all around the world, preached the gospel in lots of different countries. I've seen collapsed economies. Uh, that's coming to America. You need to look now at your net worth statement. Uh, you can make one of those. Number two is you need to buy assets and not liabilities. If you get an extra hundred bucks, the question is, how do you Honor God with that hundred dollars tithe, uh, the first ten percent. Uh, meet your basic needs and then invest in assets because your family, you and your family, are going to need them in the days ahead. I can promise you that to meet your own basic needs and do what exactly what First Thessalonians four says to minister to other people. Can, can I ask you a question here? I know yep. you, have, you have a few more things to say. So give us an idea about assets, gold, silver, real estate. What are, what are your ideas? invest in assets. Yeah. So, so assets are anything that makes you money and doesn't cost you money. So when you make a net worth statement, you should have assets on one side, liabilities on the other liabilities cost me every week. A car costs me every week, but I probably still need one. 
right? But if I owe a hundred thousand dollars on the car, I have a friend who just bought a car for hundred and eight thousand dollars, and he financed the whole thing. That's a massive payment that these guys. That's a liability. That's a liability, right? <laughs> that's a liability. Even if, just, even if you own the car and you're just paying for gas, it's still a liability, but it's less <sighs> of a liability for you, and you still need it for work or whatever the case might be. But an asset is anything that is is making you money. It's gaining. So when you think about um, inflation, for example, one of the major things that's going to happen is inflation or is happening even right before our eyes. There's there's the number of things to um, to to insulate us from the effect. And let, uh, Joseph did this. Okay, this is a biblical concept. I'm not bringing up crazy ideas outside the Bible. Um, but let me just kind of give you the ones that historically are used precious metals, gold, silver, um, uh, crypto. Think about this and this will blow your mind. The major, some of the major corporations in our country are now not holding cash reserves, Mm -hmm. but Bitcoin reserves. I just checked 10 of the 10 major companies, fortune 500 companies, Tesla, for example, bought. A, a lot of Bitcoin because they wanted to show that they were, they were liquid, that they have cash on the books, but they didn't hold it in the U S dollar. What does that tell mm-hmm. you? They don't value the U S dollar as much as they value Bitcoin. Bitcoin is becoming a reserve currency literally right before our eyes. That's huge. Yeah. And yeah, that is. Another one is, is, is commodities, corn, wheat, oil, different things like that. Um, inflation hedge stocks. Those are the ones, the stocks that you can buy that focus on uh, durable goods that, you know, stuff that lasts two or three years, um, transition, uh, green transition stuff. And this pains me to even say, but it's true. Uh, and I found this out in 2008. If you remember the president then was saying, um, you know, these banks or these car manufacturers are too big for them to fail. Mm. We're going to bail them out. And I, I, I knew financially I should jump in and buy those stocks. I mean, one of those stocks I was looking at and they were buck 25 and the U S uh, taxpayer, that means you and your children bailed them out. And those stocks went up to 16, uh, 24. The last I checked, they were $64 and I couldn't, I couldn't bear to watch it anymore. So there's things that are going to happen because of policy. So like Tesla, Um, electric cars are coming. I told a a guy in our church just, just yesterday, I said, plan on buying an electric car that pains me to even say it, but these things are moving in a way that you and I can't stop. Um, I'll I'll tell you something. Well, along the lines of electric cars, I, I agree. I mean, I look at the green agenda. I look at agenda 2030 from Bible prophecy. I can project what they're doing. Exactly. And with that, okay, electric cars are coming. They're not going to be the answer to everything because it costs. It's a lot more problem with the carbon footprint just to make one than it is to have a gas guzzler. So it doesn't solve the problem, but they don't care because there's an agenda. With that, there is copper that is going to be necessary that is off the charts to have your electric vehicles. Guess what's going to go up? I mean, in my mind, copper. You know, I mean, I'm looking at things going, okay, this is the direction they're going. Absolutely. Buying into uh, stocks that make batteries and things like that. Another one is real estate or um, uh, real estate investment trusts. Uh, um, Those, my point is you can get different assets. And, And one of the things from a very pragmatic standpoint, I tell families is you may not be able to pay off your house, but maybe you need to be talking about your family, your family unit. And what are other assets that we can sell and pay off one house so that if things really got bad, and I've been in countries where this has happened, where every, the family kind of reconsolidates, re, Mm -hmm. you know, we got one property paid off. You own 10%. I own 10%. Jack owns 10%. Mom and dad own the remaining portion, but it's paid off. We all have that together. So we know that there's one family asset that we can all come back to. That's better than everybody losing their house. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we need to start thinking along those uh, along those lines because this is coming whether we like it or not. Yeah, uh, that, that's great advice. It's already been 25 minutes, and this is where I go to questions that are live. But before we do, I hope everybody will let me just ask you about one more thing. And I really, I don't even know if we'll have time to get to Ukraine and Russia, but if we do, great. 
But lawlessness is abounding. However, lawlessness, as the way Jesus describes it in the Olivet Discourse, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to increase. It's going to get worse. In fact, I titled this uh, video today uh, something along the lines of, let me see, what, what did I title it? I can't even remember. You won't believe what is actually happening. Look, this is the reality of it. That, what you know, mainstream media, very few people apart from alternative things like this and prophecy things will tell you what's really going on. And um, so this is really going on, but lawlessness is abounding. You, you believe that we're, we're looking like we are headed towards a third world country type of situation unless barring a miracle from the Lord. Is, is, am I understanding that? Or are you thinking that? Because I'm thinking that. Well, in different parts of the country, it already looks like a third world country. Parts I mean, of California that, yes. you know, that you remember? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the coastline is... is is where the money is. Yeah. But you go inland into California and it looks more and more like a third world country. Jara and I, my wife and I, we've traveled around the world preaching the gospel. When we go back to, to our home, Southern, Southern California, we drive around and we say, we look at one another every single time. It looks more and more like, and then we start naming off the countries. Um, and and think about yeah. hom homelessness increasing. And, and quite honestly, we're being taxed to death in this, uh, uh, printing of trillions of dollars to uh, increase homelessness, drug abuse, infrastructure is collapsing. Uh, man, as I travel around, it's like, oh yeah, this looks just like uh, this country over here, Jerry. I mean, remember those bridges falling apart? I mean, it, it's horrible. So as lawlessness increases, again, we don't want to just talk about it. What are you doing right now to prepare for the increased lawlessness. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, that when lawlessness increases, love decreases. So lawlessness feeds on animosity and, and hatred and contempt. And that comes back to the whole critical theory again, uh, that we're being taught. So the question is, what do we do? And so I would suggest to you, Proverbs 22, three says this, the prudent man sees evil and hides himself. Um, Proverbs 20 talks about prepare a plan with, uh, consolation with counsel um, uh, talks about in, in Proverbs 16 about the man of mind plans his ways and the Lord will direct his steps. So you need to be thinking, I want to say this to you men, especially head of households, single moms, you need to be thinking about the security as lawlessness increases. What does a third world country look like? Well, they, they will um, fence their whole yard. They'll put dogs in it. Uh, I literally just got an email just before we jumped on. Uh, we've, we've got a ministry over there and we like, they need a security guard. Uh, we bought a car for one of our ministries in uh, West Africa and we have to park the car in a special garage every night, because if we leave it at the house where we stay, they'll come and strip the whole car at night. Battery mm. will be gone. Wheels will be gone. Catalytic converter will be cut out. Everything will be stripped off the car. It'll just, just be a frame sitting there. This is common all around the world. Yeah, it's definitely happening here in California, even in the, the valley that I live in, that you used to live in. Uh, it, it, it's happening here. And uh, but just progressing forward, understanding the direction. I was listening to someone the other day, not a believer. They were talking about the direction that things are going with the economy and that this person also believes it is intentional, but it's because everything is going to go digital. And they were really talking about cryptocurrency, big on it. They said, you aren't gonna get away from it. It is gonna go that way. And they said this, you have, and this is this was not a Christian. It wasn't anything biblical in the whole, the whole program. They said you have to be mental, physically, mentally, and spiritually prepared for what's coming because what is coming will not be stopped. Uh, barring, barring, uh, uh, what they said, um, uh, just a, a great turnaround of masses of people. You know, I'm thinking it's not going to be stopped barring a miracle. And biblically, with prophecy, I think th that's just great wisdom and everything you gave us. You got to be physically ready. You got to be mentally, pre mentally prepared. People don't realize that. Look at what fear has done in so the last two years. And then obviously spiritually prepared. Okay, let, go ahead. Tom, Tom let, yeah. me, let, me just, let me just give our viewers this, because everywhere I go and speak, 
the questions, the Q&A always, what do I do? This is what you need to do on security. Number one, you're going to read some people and they're going to say, you need a bug out bag. Friends, I've been around the world. I've backpacked my whole life, been in the mountains. Uh, trust me, you don't want a bag, a, a, a bug out bag. You want to, you want to hunker down in difficult times with your family, your mm. friends, and uh, uh, in your home, because it's easier to camp out in your home than being displaced. We've seen displaced people throughout history. It never goes well for them. They're always tortured and abused along the way. Um, there's very few situations where you want to bug out from, from your home. Number two, you want to think about basic needs and that's food, water, um, and cover. And remember first Timothy chapter mm -hmm. six, it says, be content with what food and covering. And so you need to be thinking about building. And this would be true in Southern California or any place else because of natural catastrophes. But I'm telling you, you need to start thinking about how do I build a supply of food of, of, of a couple of weeks or a month, or I would suggest everyone needs to have a goal of at least three months because in three months, when things start shaking out, uh, that gives you a lot of leeway. And then thirdly, security itself, because as lawlessness increases and these sorts of things collapse, don't be surprised if we look like Mogadishu, um, which is, which was a nightmare, which still is a nightmare. What does that look like? Here are some very practical things that we know. Um, think about your house, think about security. You need to think through the Luke 22, 36 passage on a personal level. As you do this, Jesus said to his disciples, if you, um, have a money belt, take it along. Uh, he says, if you don't have a sword, sell your coat, buy one. Now there's other passages that, that talk about, you know, fighting by the sword and die by the sword. Remember with Peter and the, but, but you have to think through your own understanding of theology. I understand this to be a passage where Jesus is talking about your own personal protection, self-defense. So here are some things. I want to give you this mm -hmm. list. If you're a lady listening right now, listen, you need to get this list down. If you're a man that's listening, you need to listen right now, really carefully get this down, watch over your family, watch over your nieces, your nephews, all of them. Number one, we know number one in security, go get a dog. Um, a, a dog... Uh, a study was done in California in the prisons. What's the number one deterrent for breaking into your house? It comes up like 98%. Number one deterrent, a dog. We'll just go find someone else that's easier to pick on. Number two, fence your yard. This is true all around the world. Um, even a four foot, just chain link fence around your house, allowing the dog to roam that. I'm telling you, your security level goes way up. Put exterior lights on. Doesn't have to be fancy. All you're trying to do is light it up in the dark. Three or number four, remove shrubs um, from around your house. Go get some um, uh, different door and and um, uh, and window magnet alarms. They'll have a decibel of 130, 140, uh, just so that way when you're sleeping at night. And I've literally been in places at night and people are breaking in in third world countries. It happens all the time. Um, and another one is, uh, um, think about pinch points in your house. If somebody breaks into your house, for example, we have a two story house and when we just put a, a string across the, the, uh, the, the, uh, steps going up and it's hooked to an alarm with 140 decibels, somebody come up there at night, <laughs> unexpectedly, they're going to be scared to death. We'll be scared to death, but we're all going to know that there's someone in the house that shouldn't be there. Um, another one's a spotlight. Another one's just a mace. The 21 rule, um, you know, uh, we learned from ancient history. There's a lot to be said for uh, blades. And and if you believe in self-defense and you, and you can do that with a clear conscience before God, uh, I want to encourage you firearms. Uh, if people uh, need to think about that at this point. Um, Mark, the, the, everything you just said was fantastic. Um, I had something really weird happen here while you were talking, and I've never had this happen before. We pay for uh, the fastest internet that we possibly can, and for some reason, my phone quit on me, and I'm having a hard time pulling up anything right now, except I do know that this broadcast is still going out, and there's people watching. So while I'm trying to get things up, I don't know what's going on. Hey, uh, Matthew or Gabe, can one of you figure out help me out here come on out from back there take that see if you can figure it out okay mark well they're working on that i want to talk about this real quick because i really want to get to the questions uh, so first of all I'm gonna, well let me say this listen everyone i have this really cool thing that i've been working on for um quite some time 
and tomorrow I'm going to have a video that's going to launch. It's with, uh, we're going to start doing tours. Vir- oh, you got it. Oh, thank you. Sometimes it's just user error, I guess. And But we're going to start launching video tours in Israel. We're also uh, uh, starting tomorrow. I'm working. It'll be posted on this channel, but I have a whole nother thing going on. There's a lot of work behind the scenes that's been happening. And I'm also going to be posting some other prophecy teachings from other teachers on this, uh, on what's coming up. And uh, I'm not going to announce much of it tomorrow yet. Tomorrow you can watch it. It's going to be, we're going to be um, these uh, Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. This is going to be off the charts. Trust me, it's going to be really, really, really good. You're going to be super blessed. It'll be uh, posted here on Tuesday. I'll give you a little bit more info at that time. But then next week, I'm going to give you a lot more info about what's coming. Part of it, I'm probably going to be including Mark because I think I can twist his arm and get him involved with me on this project. But with that, okay, we got this working again. And so I can start taking questions now for anybody. If you have questions, uh, put questions, at, the word question, all caps, send them in to me. Mark, while that's happening, listen, you said something to me just before we went live about the remnant that's out there and churches. So many churches have gone woke and so forth. I, I think, you know, tell everybody what you were telling me, if you don't mind, unless it's a secret, you don't want to tell anybody yet. Yeah. So Tom, I've been so burdened uh, as I've been helping Jan and, and, you know, doing different events with you, people are coming out of this. We need to figure out how to plant, help, help our brothers and sisters around the United States and, and maybe even around the world. We need to plant five churches um, a month. And so uh, uh, we're working right now on a strategy, a plan where folks can reach out to us and say, you know, I live in such and such a town. There's not a, a church. Would you would you help us? And so we'll see how that all all unfolds. Yeah. You know, well, I'm excited to, and anything I can do to help out. And I would also ask people to be praying about that. Um, and uh, it, and because, Mark, I think God has given you something that's necessary for the days that we live in. If people got to be in house, uh, churches, it's a church in their house. Praise the Lord. That's how the church began. You know, Chuck Smith said. It's how, yeah, go ahead. That's how it began, and that's how it's going to end. I mean, that's that's because persecution is coming here in America. Yep. It's already, it, it's already happened. It is, it is coming. And I've, I've seen, I'm, I'm a little bit excited about some fruit that I saw. I was in Las Vegas yesterday preaching. Uh, they asked me to bring a couple of prophecy messages and I did wonderful uh, people. And I found out there's three churches in Las Vegas. Billy Crone, I already knew, but two others, uh, the one I spoke at and another one I heard about, they speak on Bible prophecy. And I thought, you know what? Praise the Lord. But I mean, we're watching churches close not willing to be open so many that are open are woke and listen chuck smith said years ago mark chuck was the uh founder of calvary chapels he said years ago as the church began he believes that's how it's going to finish before the rapture it's going to be house churches and you're you're saying hey what can i do you're you you've been around for a long time and uh i love you 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 got all kinds of wisdom which i really appreciate and i want to come along your side to support whatever work i can uh, okay here's a question what should i do about my 401k yeah so i you know uh again there's different there's different approaches some it depends on your age i'm not a financial advisor so i'm not trying to give yeah. financial advice uh, but I, at the same time, I think you need to use wisdom. There are different funds um, that, that, uh, for example, tips, treasury inflation protection securities uh, is one way of preparing and insulating yourself from the inflation. Um, RETs, uh, real estate investment trusts. I, if I can't buy real property, I don't have enough money to buy real property, you know, a house next door, whatever the case might be. Um, I can buy stocks that are buying property and they have mortgages and so forth. It's the next best thing. So I think you just got to think outside the box a bit, but realizing there is inflation coming, realizing that um, this monetary change is going to happen. You need to have real assets so that the wealth that God has given you to meet your own needs, to advance the gospel and to care for others isn't just totally evaporate. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, back to what you had said earlier about planning churches. This person's from Australia. They say Gold Coast 
Gold Coast Australia needs needs a Calvary Chapel. I'll say this, there's, just because they're Calvary doesn't mean they're going the right direction. I've seen uh, many, it, what, what is needed right now are men who are willing to stand up and say, you know, let me lead in truth. There's a, there's, it's easy to sit back and do nothing, but uh, listen, I believe God's raising up people, whether it be in Australia or in America or Canada, but the Western world, okay, Mark, you, have a, you understand missions, you understand foreign countries, third world countries, because you've been so involved, Africa and so forth. Um, when you look at America, and you think, you know, in, in Africa, in Muslim countries, in China, if there's a pastor there, they're risking their lives. Absolutely. Here, there, there's no, we're there's not, no mediocrity. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no mediocrity. Here, yeah. it's, it's not like that. So, you know, people have to, things are changing. Well, I'll tell you, critical theory is moving the church uh, right here in Minneapolis area. Um, you've got to make up your mind. Are you in or are you out? And there's a there's a, a separating that's happened. I call it the reshuffling of the deck uh, where the sheep and the goats. Now, I realize that's a, a term that Jesus has used, uses at his second coming as we go into the millennial kingdom. But by principle we're seeing that separation happen, not only among churches, not only among pastors, but among congregations. And so people are leaving. I had a gentleman come just the other day. So I've been going to this church for 22 years, Mark, the pastor got up and said, we're going to be doing this. This is antithetical to the very truth of the Bible. I can't go there anymore. Is this church going to hold on to the Bible? I said, we're going to follow Jesus. Um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the father but by him. Uh, this is the word of life. The book is the word of life. And that's what we're going to be studying and following. So, so they become part of our, our church family. So we see this reshuffling happening throughout our city. And mm -hmm. there are very few churches left in Minneapolis. It's a heartbreak to me. So we're going to help people. They're going to have to be courageous. We need people who are courageous followers of Jesus. who are going to step up, not whine about it and say, um, we need a church here. My house is going to be the church, just like Lydia's house was the house church Amen. in the in the early church. Mark, how do we do this? Our goal is, is to help as many as possible do that. Amen. I, I love that. I just I, I really am encouraged by everything that you're uh, you're saying on that. I just I, I, that's the direction that we are going. Uh, this question is, says, do you think pastors preaching if anyone worships the beast and its image? It receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. People wouldn't be so freaked out about the the um, medical thing. Um, listen, I I can take that one if you want me to. <laughs> so listen, I the the bottom line is the Bible does talk about Revelation chapter thirteen. Uh, there's a mark of the beast. I personally don't believe this medical thing that's happening is the mark of the beast. I believe what's happening right now is conditioning. So I'm always going to sound. The, the alarms when it comes to uh, Bible prophecy, that's what a watchman is supposed to do. Ezekiel's very clear uh, as, as God to call them to be a watchman. If you don't sound the alarm, their blood is going to be on your hands, Ezekiel. So we see these things. We can say, uh, Mark, it looks to me like what's happening right now in the world, um, even the, the citizen dividing that we talked about in the beginning is casting a shadow into the tribulation. We're not seeing the fulfillment of the Bible prophecies yet, but man, does it look like it is the setup for all of it. At least your your thoughts on that. I use the term trajectory, okay? Yeah. So my, my wife yesterday was coming to church. Uh, she hit some ice and she slid around as a 360 on the, on the freeway and slides off the road. So her trajectory was in a movement off of the road into the snowbank, right? Uh, if you served in the military, you talk mm -hmm. about trajectory, artillery, where's the bullet today, but where's it going to end up when it lands? So trajectory. So the things that are happening now around medical issues, mandates, whatever the case might be, all of these things are conditioning and trajectory for the opportunities that the antichrist is going to use in the days ahead. And uh, even unsaved people are coming to me and saying, Mark, this is last day stuff, isn't it? I'm going, yeah, that's why yeah. you need to believe in Jesus now. Yeah. You know, that's really remarkable, isn't it? I, I, I know so many churches that have closed or just completely gone woke, yep. even in the Calvary chapels. Um, you're not a Calvary chapel, just so you guys know, uh, uh, Mark's not. Um, but even 
I we're watching them go up, but I'm seeing so many people who never had a claim to being part of a church, never knew the Lord, maybe atheist or agnostic, but not that interested. I'd seen them wake up to say exactly what you exactly what you just said. But this, doesn't the Bible say something like this? Maybe they saw some movie or heard someone like, you know, Hal Lindsey or whatever years ago, one message stuck in the back of their head somewhere. But this is also evidence of the need that we have to continue to proclaim the gospel, isn't it? Because people will get saved even during the tribulation. Absolutely. Now, we're not in the tribulation, but but right now, Jesus is mighty to save, and he's still saving people. Now, my evangelism, personal evangelism, looks different today than it did uh, pre-pandemic, but but there are people that, that God is touching. God's working in their life. Uh, uh, just just this last week, there was a guy who who uh, had come to, come to church. Um, he heard us speaking, Tom, on this very subject. And, and, uh, and, and he was just so convicted. He was driving home the other day and he said, Lord, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need you to save me from my sins. I know you died on the cross. I trust in you now. He trusted Christ in his car, came back to the church and told me about it. Um, went home, told her, told his wife and she's bawling. You know, I mean, God, God is still mighty to save. And Amen. all of these things are, are, are convicting a different group of people that have kind of like been sitting dormant. Amen. Uh, I, I love everything that you're sharing today. Okay, this goes back to the question about money. This person asks, uh, should we take money out of the banks soon? What do you think? I mean, you're not a financial advisor, so I understand we both got to be careful on some of these things, but what are, you, what are your thoughts? Okay, so, so yes, I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not giving financial advice. I'm telling you what I've done. Um, I've always been one that uh, viewed highly holding on to cash and and having um, uh, being liquid, pay off your debts, more assets, buy assets, not liabilities, and and hold on to cash because cash cash is king. That's the way we've always thought mm -hmm. as Americans. Cash is king when things are difficult. That's not true when you print trillions and trillions of dollars. That's not true when you um, suppress the whole workforce so that the the demand on goods is high and and the uh, productivity and delivery systems. Um, and so the, the, the dollar is being devalued, Tom, the way I like to describe it is this in 1900, a $20 gold piece would buy you a brand new expensive suit. Today we have a, a $20 bill that only fills up yeah. half of my, it doesn't even fill up half of my truck tank to drive to work. Yeah. Okay. Now, if I have a, a $20 gold piece, still um, a real $20 gold piece. I can still go and actually buy a suit with that today, a thousand dollar suit, $1,800 yeah. suit. And so there's the difference between fiat money versus hard money. And so I would suggest to you as inflation takes place, we need to move assets more and more to things that are, that, that have intrinsic value or have value that, transcends the inflation time. That's, that's such as gold, such as land, um, such as products and goods. And I, I watched this happen in Europe with the Euro 20 years ago, the Euro's 20 years old today. Um, when they came out and, and it'll go one of two ways. I'm not sure how it's going to go yet for the U S dollar, but if they do it slowly, like they did with the Euro, they went to the Germans and they said for every, uh, uh, for every Deutschmark or whatever it was of your currency, we'll give you five euros. And then it was four euros. And then uh, six months later, it was three euros. And I remember being in London and there were riots going on in Germany because they said, you only have 30 days. And right now we're going to give you for every, I think it was Deutschmarks, two, two Deutschmarks and we'll give you one euro. So they, they made this transition. And so if it goes slow, there'll be time for you to, to make adjustments. But you know, the Germans were holding out, we're not gonna go to that, we're not gonna go to that. No, you are going to that whether you like it or not. And so um, it could happen fast though, if it happens fast and you're sitting on cash, um, from traveling the world, I would say, my experience would be if they do it fast, which is, is likely, like you just wake up, the Russians did this in the Ukraine. That you just woke up one morning instead of having uh, the, the, the former currency, they just changed it overnight. 
Um, right then you take all of the, all of your, your dollars and you go buy anything that you can that has any value at all, because basically your money is absolutely worthless, but it'll take time for people to catch on to that. I can um, elaborate more if you want. But. No, thank you very much. Okay, I got to, I, I, wanna, I, I wanna mention this. It was amazing Grace said to Kathy Myers, I'm surprised they, that would be you and I, are having this kind of talk on here. My understanding of Bible prophecy is we will be gone before all of this takes place. Gog, May, Magog is taking place right now. I, I'd love to deal with this, and then you could deal with it. Gog, Magog is not taking place right now. That's some bad teaching. Anybody who teaches that is, is, is that's really bad Bible teaching. And as far as thinking that we're not going to go through things, listen, if we went back two years, who would have thought that we would be in the world that we've been in for the last two years? And people are thinking we're not going to see inflation. We're, look at what's happened in the last three months alone and what the trajectory is right now for the next three months. I mean, you start looking at this, you're going, wait a minute. God gave Joseph wisdom to understand, wait, I better be, I better be listening to what God is saying. God does nothing unless he speaks it through his prophets. And God speaks through his prophetic word to us today. And he, he expects us to have wisdom. But Mark, this is a problem that's happened within American Christianity for a long time. I, I got saved uh, 30 some years ago, 32, 33 years ago. Okay. In that 34 years ago. So in that I was told because of the rapture in the beginning, I'm not going to have to worry about going through anything. That was the Calvary Chapel teaching. This type of thinking is what has captured the majority of Americans who believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Both you and I are pre-trib. But it, being pre-trib doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. You're not going to go through hard times. You're not going to be persecuted. We will not suffer the wrath of God. But, but you know, people, and part of, I feel like 80% of my ministry is trying to get people to wake up and realize what's really going on. And you don't have to look back very far to realize, look, two years ago, you would have never thought that we would be here now. That people would say you have to have an identification to be able to enter into a restaurant to buy or sell something. That you, uh, that we're going to have this hyperinflation, which is entering into already. We're watching it across the board. We are watching the store shelves running out of food. We are hearing what the farmers are saying. They're lacking the fertilizer to be able to produce the produce that needs to be produced. Listen, I could sit here and say, you know what, everything's going to be good. I would be a lying prophet as it was in the days of Jeremiah. God used Jeremiah to call out the prophets who were saying, all's going to be good. You don't have to worry about it. He used Jeremiah to call them out because they were lying. And God was saying, it's going to get bad and you guys need to repent and you guys need to be ready. You better be ready physically, spiritually, and mentally. Joseph understood it. Jeremiah understood it. Isaiah understood it. The minor prophets understood it. The major prophets understood it. Jesus taught this thinking. The apostles taught this thinking. The book of Revelation gives us the understanding of the things that are going to happen during the tribulation period. We will be raptured before them, but we, the rapture does not, there's nothing in the Bible that leads us to even have an inkling that just because you're a Christian and you're going to be raptured, means you're not going to go through go through some very difficult things. That's my two cents. Amen. Bless you, Tom. You're absolutely right. And only Americans have been duped into believing that um, everything is going to be peaceful and wonderful until we're raptured and then everything falls apart. I've got, uh, we care for a widow. My family's cared for a widow. Her husband for preaching the gospel was chopped into 16 pieces with a machete in India. Another one of my dear friends, Julius, when he takes his shirt off, there's scars all over his body where they hacked him up with a machete. Listen, suffering for Jesus is what the Christians have done in North Korea. It's what they've experienced in Cuba. It's what they've experienced in Venezuela. It's what they've experienced in China. Um, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. The world's going to hate you. Um, but don't worry. I prepared a place for you. Christian friends, Jesus has prepared a place for you. He is preparing a place for you in heaven, but it's not necessarily going to be easy here. Acts 14, 
the apostle Paul, after he started all the churches in Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, it says he traveled back through appointing elders in every city, instructing them and saying this to them, it says strengthening them by many tribulations, not the tribulation, but by many tribulations, you shall enter the kingdom of heaven. How about this? Second Timothy chapter four, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if that's the case, so, so Tom, one of the things I always tell people is you need to think about economics right now. You need to be thinking about security right now, but you also need to be thinking about your spiritual condition. And, and let me just say it this way. You and I are about American Christians specifically, and, and actually the rest of the free world, New Zealand and so forth. We've been so blessed, but it's kind of like going on the ultimate um, hiking trip. Several years ago, I took my wife and we hiked up Mount Whitney. Now we've always walked and hiked in the mountains and stuff, but Jarrah had never done a 22 mile trip uh, with a backpack. And so um, we trained for six months. And I want to say this in a spiritual sense, you got to start training for the journey that's ahead. You got to drop some of the spiritual fat that you and I have been carrying as American Christians, because this is not going to be pretty. You need to be prepared. So let me, can I give you just a quick handful of things, Tom? Mm -hmm. One, if you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, you need to trust him today. You need to get on the right team because there's only two teams, God's team, Satan's team. And you come in on Satan's team, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he shall be saved. That's number one. Number two is you need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus in a way that you never have. I mean, really need to take him seriously, read the scriptures, pray. You need to think about the scriptures, not just, not just like it's like, it's just kind of like a BB rolling around, but like it says in flip or um, Psalm chapter one, where it says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the seat, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law, he meditates, he thinks day and night. Satan wants us distracted. We got Christians walking around like this, distracted, distracted, distracted. You have got to draw near to God and think, 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 think scripturally, biblically for the things that are happening around you. Then you got to live it. And then you need to be in church. And I realize many of us have dysfunctional churches, there's a lot of dysfunctional churches. Corinth was a dysfunctional church. First uh, Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, when you read it, they were a dysfunctional church. They had some dysfunction in them. Uh, church at Philippi had some dysfunction. And, and remember, Odia and Syntyche are fighting with one another in chapter four. Um, you're not going to have a perfect church, but what you can do this is grow with a group of people. And I realize you might be in a town. We've started churches in towns where there wasn't a church to go to. Um, I want to say this. We need men and women who will say, you know what? My house will become the house where Jesus is known and proclaimed in this city. And just, just like in the new Testament, we need people like that in the town where I started our first church in battle at Mesa, there was this couple, uh, Jim and Judy lemon. They may even be watching this great couple love Jesus, but they had trusted Christ. And, uh, uh, there wasn't a, a strong Bible teaching church there. So they, so they just started inviting people to their home. They would listen back in the days of cassettes, you know, <laughs> this is, this is before all the technology blessings we have. And they just started praying. They asked God to, to give them a church. Seven years, they prayed seven years, they ministered to people. And in the providence of God, Jared and I go to battle at Mesa and God did a, a great, great work there. There's a great church there. And that spawned off other churches, a multitude of other churches. So, um, take these things really serious, build family relationships. Cause I'm going to tell you when things melt down, it's going to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And I've seen this around the world, friends, it's going to be brothers and sisters of Christ that you're going to suffer with. You're going to share with, you're going to, you're going to endure the hardship with, um, you got to build relationships, do it, do it, do it at all costs, build godly relationships with God's people. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I, you, I've held you here much longer than I told you. Uh, I did have somebody who had sent in an email while we were sitting here and they said, what's that? Sounds like there's rustling of tissue paper, some background noise. It was me. It's my jacket. That's what people are hearing. So I can't wear this jacket on here anymore. And also I want to apologize for the way I came off on amazing grace with that uh, with the comment about why we were talking these things i get a little bit passionate because i'm very concerned that too many christians are not understanding how much the world has changed and the bible does not promise us these things and there's just some erroneous teaching that's out there um, and i'm very concerned about that that christians are not 
understanding the days that we live in and we do not know the timing of the rapture could be tonight but if it's not for three more years what are you going to do one time mark i said what if it's not for 10 more years man i got lit up with people how could you say that so uh with that uh mark you have closing thoughts february 10th jam markel mark henry and myself it's a thursday a couple weeks out yeah february 10th join us mark henry ministries.com right down there in the in the box below, you can see that MarkHenryMinistries.com. Join the live stream. We'll be uh, having a great time following Jesus there. And Tom, one last thing. I want you to catch, I want our friends to catch this. Persecution keeps us from loving this world. Remember in 1 John, it says the world is passing away in its lust, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Let this time purify our souls of our affection for this world, our love for this world. Heaven Amen. is awesome. Jesus has prepared a place for you. It's going to be great. Amen. And I want to say this because I probably scared some people today. The fear of man is a snare. But when we understand these things, these signs, they point to the second coming of Christ. In the meantime, let's be prepared and uh, spiritually, mentally, physically be prepared. Be smart. We will be home with Jesus. Thank you, Mark. I wish I said all the same things with the same smile you have. <laughs> but that's great. Uh, appreciate you very much. Great brother, great friend. And uh, I will be talking with you again tomorrow with you and Jan. So God bless. Bye, everybody. To.